welcome to CS208. I think we're uh, two or three folks short, but uh, we'll get started. So on the screen is a Bower bird. Uh, no relation, B-O-W-E-R. This course is not about birds, but I like birds, so there will be birds. Interesting thing about this bower bird that lives in Australia, it really likes blue things. It decorate, it makes this bower to uh, attract a mate and just finds everything blue that it can. Plastic, ribbon, string, and puts it all over. Uh, and we can also see it assembling the non-blue part of the bower here. So that concludes the bird portion of today. Uh, a little bit about me. Um, please call me Aaron. I'm pretty new to Carlson. This is my third year uh, here in the CS department. I did my undergrad in Massachusetts at Williams College and PhD at University of Washington in Seattle. And uh, I like hiking and backpacking, Dungeons and Dragons, games of all kind, uh, history and musical theater. So some big picture goals for this course. Um, I, let me first say a couple things before I get into that. Uh, one, being in a mask, please let me know if you're having any trouble hearing me. Uh, this is a kind of new in-person masked uh, lecture for all of us, at least for me. Um, and the second thing, since this classroom has this like nifty wide-angle camera and microphone, I'm going to try recording these uh, lectures and posting them so that you can uh, go back and, and refer to them if you want. I know that it was a, uh, a silver lining about the online courses, so trying that out for, for this course, wanted to let you know. All right, so big picture. This course will make you a better program. And that's not so much because we're going to learn a new language, though C may be a new language for some of you. Uh, it's not that we're going to write huge amounts of code um, or uh, work with incredibly sophisticated or complicated algorithms. It's that this course will challenge you to do kinds of programming to use types of tools that perhaps you have not used in any other course. So there will be assignments focused entirely on kind of picking apart an existing program to kind of understand how to give it exactly the right input so that it does what you want. Uh, there will be uh, a lab about mounting a classic uh, a security attack called a buffer overflow on an existing piece of code. And there will be assignments where you will be working at perhaps a lower level in the kind of structure of the computer system uh, than you have before. In, in general, need to think very carefully about exactly what the computer system is doing, since this course is about understanding exactly what the computer system is doing. So we're going to uh, kind of go deeper and deeper into uh, uh, the nitty gritty details. What kind of courses CS208? It's a course that emphasizes independent problem solving. So this will be a course where the assignments will expect you to do some exploration, to follow some provided tutorials, to learn the necessary tools. There's an element of kind of figuring things out for yourself that is a key part of this course and is a skill that uh, I want you to practice uh, as a result of, of taking 208. So, what goes along with this and what comes up every time I have asked uh, folks that have taken this course previously what advice they would give uh, to people that take it in the future, the number one thing that comes up is to start the lab assignments early and to ask lots of questions. And this goes along with this independent theme is that these are, there are points in this course where you're likely kind of to get stuck on something. That's expected, that's kind of part of, of what uh, helps you learn, but if you get stuck the day that the thing is due, of the two week time you had to do it, rather than you know three days in after it's assigned, then it's a lot harder to get help and to 
uh, not be really stressed out about trying to complete this. So starting early, asking lots of questions, uh, key to success. Any questions about these themes? All right, so uh, before I get into going over some parts of the syllabus, I should also say I'm confronted here by my old nemesis, the blackboard. Uh, every term I ask for classrooms that have whiteboards. Not every term do I get what I want. Uh, so I apologize in advance for anything illegible that I write on the blackboard that is, uh, that is what gets me. And if there are words or things that are not clear, please just ask me. Uh, I know that it's bad. Okay. So the syllabus is, in fact, just uh, the course website. And you can get to the course website from the course Moodle course webpage. It's linked there right at the top. And the most useful thing on this course webpage is this calendar. Uh, the calendar uh, lays out all the topics for the term, when the quizzes will be due, when the assignments will be due. Uh, so you can use this to plan uh, and know when, when things are going to happen. Uh, it also has uh, my office hours on the calendar. So that's, I'm going to be in my office, which is Olin 339, the third floor of Olin, uh, 10 to noon Mondays and uh, 4.30 to 5.30 on Wednesdays. And then on Tuesday evenings, 7.30 to 9, I will be in the lab on the third floor of Olin uh, 310. And uh, I have these office hours uh, Monday through Wednesday because that tends to be when uh, work is due in this course. And I have found that if I have office hours right after work is due, nobody comes. So uh, that's why it's, it's Monday through Wednesday. But uh, I'm always happy to meet other times. Just, just send me an email and we can, we can set something up. All right, other things to know. Uh, in addition to getting help from me, uh, there are lab assistants who will be holding hours um, in uh, Olin 310. Uh, they should not say Discord. That's a, that's a relic from our online times. Um, although there is a CS Discord server, which is linked from the, uh, the Moodle page. So Oliver Calder, he has been course staff for 28 for many terms now. He knows this material really well. He has uh, a number of hours that he will be in uh, Olin 310, so he's an, an excellent resource to get help from. Uh, and there's also uh, a schedule of other lab assistants uh, linked from here. And uh, I have uh, noted here the, the folks of those lab assistants who have actually taken 208. Uh, you are free to ask people who have not taken 208 for help. Uh, your mileage may vary with that. Uh, Course textbook is Computer Systems, a Programmer's Perspective, um, third edition. Significant changes since the second edition, so uh, I, I would not recommend getting that. Um, uh, there will be short assigned readings uh, as well as practice problems that I'll pick out from the textbook. Uh, every term, uh, when I ask for feedback, there are some people who say, I wish I had read the textbook more. And there are some people that say, I never opened the textbook. So uh, mixed bag on that one. Um, so uh, it's fortunately not, not too expensive. Uh, but if cost is an issue, please uh, come talk to me. I'm sure we can uh, figure something out. Um, but I just wanted to be transparent that not everyone finds the textbook useful. I find it a really helpful reference um, for, for all that we're doing in the course. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll be programming in C as well as uh, x86 uh, assembly. Uh, we'll, for the most part, need to be in a Linux environment, and I will demonstrate on Friday how to connect to uh, a computer science department uh, web server that's all set up with everything we need. Uh, but uh, as explained here, there's also ways to kind of work on your own computer uh, that would not require an, an internet connection. So the kind of 
grading for this course is uh, primarily from uh, programming labs. They will uh, be every one and a half weeks or, or so throughout the term. Uh, in addition to the labs, there will be uh, short weekly quizzes. These will be on Moodle. Uh, they will be made available Monday mornings. They will be due Tuesday 9 p.m. And they're primarily a way for you to practice the concepts that we've learned in class. Uh, for most, but not all of the questions, there will be immediate feedback as to whether uh, you got them correct, and you will have an unlimited number of attempts, and it's not timed. So my intention is that you will kind of uh, practice, use these to practice, and kind of work through them until you have gotten all the questions correct. Um, it is, of course, possible to just brute force through the questions, try all like 100 different possible answers. I guarantee you that will take you more time than if you just think about the question and, and or review the material uh, so that you can understand it without just brute forcing through it. So, I encourage you to use, use the quizzes as an opportunity to practice, and then we'll have a take-home final exam that will be handed out on the last day. Well, it will be online, but it will be made available the last day uh, of class and due at the end of exams. Um, a note about the lab grading. Uh, the labs will all have provided test cases or other forms of automated grading, and it's the, what the automated grade says is the minimum grade that you will earn on that lab. So it's not, it's, and it in fact is the case uh, that you could earn a passing grade even if all the test cases are failing uh, because uh, we will be looking for kind of evidence of, of serious effort and giving partial credit for those. And um, uh, the best way to earn partial credit is to kind of write down your approach or what you tried or how you went about debugging. Um, but just know that the, the test cases are kind of the minimum grade, um, not, not the final set. Questions so far? There we are. All right. One, uh, in terms of late work, uh, you will have four late days, uh, four uh, separate 24-hour extensions that you can use throughout the term. Uh, you can use them on lab assignments or quizzes, uh, not the final exam. Um, and to use them, you just email me saying, I would like to use a late day, and your deadline is extended 24 hours for whatever quiz or assignment that is, and you can use them one at a time uh, as you need them. So those are there to, to give you kind of the uh, flexibility as we, as we go through the term. So a note on inclusivity. Uh, I just want to, uh, this is a, a really important aspect of helping us all learn and succeed together. So I just want to, to read this statement here. Uh, please treat your classmates with kindness and respect, both inside the classroom and out. Classrooms can be vulnerable environments. Asking questions and expanding our knowledge um, requires us to reveal that we don't know everything, uh, that we're, we're still learning. And it's okay not to know everything. Uh, but it's not okay to make people feel bad for what they don't know. This, that's the point. We're learning. And this can happen in, in even subtle ways. So our individual differences enrich and enhance our understanding of one another and the world around us, and this class welcomes perspectives of all ethnicities, genders, religions, ages, sexual orientations, disabilities, socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, and nationalities. All right. Any other questions on this syllabus administrivia stuff? All right. So. I want to, to do some demos to kind of illustrate uh, the importance of some of the, uh, some of the concepts that we're going to look, uh, look at in this class in a, in a practical sense. Uh, so let me bring this up here, make the font readable.
All right, is this a readable font size for the folks in the back? Awesome. All right, so the first thing that I want to look at is uh, a Java program that does something that uh, is pretty boring. It multiplies four numbers together and prints out the result. Now, if this just, you know, multiplied this as expected and printed out the product, uh, this would be a boring example and there'd be no reason for me to show it to you. So something weird is going to happen here. Uh, anyone care to hazard a guess of what weird thing might happen? Yes? Yes, so what's going to happen is something called overflow, and this is a consequence of the fact that computers only have a finite amount of memory to represent a number. When we store a number on a computer, we have to decide ahead of time how we're actually going to represent it. And the way that Java represents an integer, and in fact the way uh, uh, integers are, are represented uh, in computer programs in, in general, uh, we see the following behavior. So if I uh, compile my int test, and then run it, we have this huge negative number, which, you know, not what we'd expect multiplying 200 by 300 by 400 by 500. And uh, this is uh, something that as programmers we need to be aware of because if suddenly there's a multiplication or other arithmetic operation that's having this overflow behavior where instead of positive it's somehow like going back to back around to negative numbers uh, this can be the source of uh, really unpleasant uh, unpleasant bugs in, in the program this sort of thing has uh, uh, caused rockets to explode for example um, so very very important to be to be aware of so here's another uh, number one for you. This time about floats. So uh, in math, we would say that multiplication is associative, which means that we should be able to kind of parenthesize this, these two products either way, and that we get the same, uh, the same result. So we would expect this program to print out point 375, two times, and then print out true. But again, as a consequence of how numbers are represented on a computer, uh, we will see that we don't exactly get 0.375 twice. We get, you know, close to 0.375. I mean, the, the error is in the quintillionths, so, you know, pretty close. Uh, but those two are not equal. And it turns out most uh, of these floating point numbers that you see in a computer program are a lie in the sense that they are the computer getting as close as it can to the particular number. And again, this is a consequence of we have a finite number, uh, a finite amount of computer memory, and it's in binary, and so it's restricted by what can be represented as a binary fraction. What can be represented with a divisor that is a power of two. And anything that can't, it approximates, gets as close as it can. And in this example, uh, the, this, the, the first uh, x, the, fir the product that we do first gives us 0.25. That's one over four. We can represent that exactly. The second product, uh, y, we do. We get 0.15 from that first multiplication. We can't represent exa that exactly, and so that's where that six in the quintillions place shows up. And so again, we've got to be aware as programmers that uh, we can't just assume floating point numbers are kind of perfectly perfectly accurate, and there are trade-offs involved. Uh, in, in these sorts of designs. What are your questions on, on either of these examples? Yes? So, 
why are floating point numbers represented as kind of uh, using using divisors that are powers of two rather than just representing the digits like beyond the, the decimal point? Yeah, so that's an excellent question to, to answer briefly. Uh, we have speed versus accuracy. So we could represent numbers exactly, but that's going to make doing fast math with them a lot harder. That might take up more memory. And so the design that uh, has kind of become universal, this IEEE uh, 754 standard, uh, choose a kind of a particular point in this trade-off that is pretty accurate, uh, but can still be fairly fast. How are we doing on time? Pretty good, okay. So, let's move on from looking at how things are represented in memory to thinking about, okay, uh, how fast do programs run? Because right, when we're thinking about programming in the real world, we often have to care about how fast uh, something is, is, going to, is going to go. So uh, let's look at computing a factorial. And uh, a factorial uh, is something like, if we said five factorial, which we write with an exclamation point, uh, that would be 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 uh, times 1. So we just want to write a function to compute this factorial. Uh, so we have a function that takes in an integer and then just uses a for loop to go through the numbers from uh, 1 up to n and multiply them all together. And then we have another function to compute a factorial that takes in an n and then recursively computes this product. So makes a, uh, makes a recursive call to compute the, the factorial of n minus 1 and then multiplies that by n. So uh, when we're uh, thinking about this at, at a high level, these two approaches to computing a factorial are kind of perhaps a stylistic difference. Uh, that we wouldn't necessarily expect them to uh, uh, perform differently uh, in, in practice, but that's actually uh, not the case. And so if I go ahead and compute uh, the factorials from uh, 0 up to 20,000 using both of these uh, uh, functions and then time it, I will find out that um, they in fact do not perform equivalently. The recursive one is significantly slower than the one that uses a loop. And uh, this is a consequence of how Java implements function calls. That making a function call turns out to involve a lot more work than doing another iteration of a loop. This is true in Python, it's true in C, it's true in many languages. And so this is an important thing to understand that uh, Recursion, necessary sometimes, but often slower. There are uh, less common programming languages, uh, such as uh, a scheme or, or uh, functional languages like this, that are, much, that are much more about recursion than that where recursion is the expected way and that the uh, language uh, interpreters or compilers are set up to make recursion uh, work uh, faster than, than, say, Java is. But as we'll see later in the term, uh, we will actually dig into the uh, assembly code that is generated when you compile a C program. And we'll see exactly how much more work is involved with making a function call uh, versus uh, doing an iteration of a loop. All right, the final example here uh, is slightly more involved. Um, and so here I have a, a large two-dimensional array, just like a 10,000 by 10,000 array of doubles in Java. And I fill them up uh, with random numbers. So we have uh, 10,000 by 10,000 random doubles. And I just want to sum all these doubles up. 
and I have two ways of computing this sum. I have what I call the IJ way, where I have a nested loop where the outer loop goes around kind of the, the first dimension of the array and the inner loop goes around the second and compute the sum that way. And then what I call the JI approach, where all I've done is switch the order of the loops. So I have one, one where I go around the, uh, I loop over the outer dimension and then the inner dimension and then the reverse. One where I loop over the inner dimension and the outer dimension. So same number of additions, both ways. But, and, and so just looking at the code, I might expect these to be exactly the same. But it turns out there are things going on inside the computer system that make these, even though all I've done is switch the order of two loops, uh, that make these quite different. So you switch the order of the loop and your code gets five times, more than five times slow. This is due to something called caching. It's because there's part of the computer's memory that's saving recently accessed data to make it faster the next time uh, you access it. But in this case, it's saving chunks of data that are contiguous in memory. Like part of this class is gonna be thinking very carefully about where in memory are things stored. Because it really matters. Because we switch these loops so that instead of accessing things that are next to each other in memory, we're jumping around, and our code gets much, much slower. And so this is something that's entirely hidden. Like there's nothing in the Java that tells us the computer is going to cache this way or, or, or this other way. It's just something that we have to know about whatever system we're working with. All right, what are your, what are your questions about these? All right, so kind of the, the last thing that I, I want to mention on this kind of overview of, of the themes is that kind of we have this kind of picture of, of how computer systems are, are structured. Um, we're kind of at the top, we have algorithms, data structures, applications. Uh, below that we have programming languages. And most of uh, the uh, computer science curriculum is, is, is up here, thinking about um, uh, applying uh, computing to different interesting tasks or studying programming languages themselves or studying algorithms. Uh, and uh, we might, in say 251, uh, talk about compilers or interpreters. And um, in this class, we're going to kind of descend down this, uh, these layers of abstraction uh, to understand, okay, what role is the operating system, Windows or Mac or Linux, what role is that playing uh, in, in computer systems? Uh, we're going to look at assembly programming, kind of what the uh, hardware, what, the op what operations the underlying computer hardware is actually executing, uh, and this is Defined, uh, this is uh, specified by something called the instruction set architecture. And uh, below this, we have um, uh, digital logic circuits, 
how uh, numbers are represented, how caching works, kind of all the, the, the hardware uh, nuts and bolts. Um, and so this is to say that kind of we're going to be living in, uh, in this space, uh, in this class, um, and trying to understand kind of what is going on underneath the surface when we actually run a computer program. So a bit of background so that we're all on the same page. I just want to s briefly sketch out um, a kind of uh, idealized picture of, of part of a computer system and the part that we're going to focus the most attention on. Uh, so we have the CPU or central processing unit. Uh, this is... The part of the computer that handles doing math, making arithmetic happen, and moving data around. Now, these are the two main things that our, our CPU is going to do. And we're going to focus a lot on how this interacts with the computer's memory. So, uh, when we have uh, a computer program, we have variables that have certain values uh, as the program runs, uh, and, and that's what is going to live in the computer's memory. Uh, and you might also have seen this called RAM, uh, short for random access memory. That's the kind of electrical component that in most systems forms the computer's memory. And uh, it won't be our focus in this course, but the other way uh, that a computer keeps track of data would be the hard disk. Um, And the key aspect of this is that it's persistent, that it doesn't require an electrical current to store the information. The computer's memory does. So I shut down my computer, everything in the memory disappears. Because it, once it doesn't have electrical current, it can't maintain uh, its current state. Whereas hard disk can, so the, the files and programs live on the hard disk and then are loaded into memory when we need to use them. Questions on this? All right. So the last uh, topic that I wanted to get to today uh, was, is uh, something that we're going to be working with throughout the term, and that is uh, ways of representing numbers or data uh, that are stored on a computer. And so I want to start with talking about binary or base two numbers. And to, to illustrate this, let's think about uh, the, the numbers that we that we know and love, which are our base ten numbers, uh, which have a ones place, a tens place, a hundreds place, and so on. And we know that uh, the number twenty three is. 2 times 10 plus 3 times 1. And we uh, can think about this uh, as uh, 2 times 10 to the first plus 3 times 10 to the zero power, which is 1. And in fact, all of these places can be rewritten as 10 to some power. 10 to the first, 10 squared, 10 cubed, so on. So this is where the name base 10 comes from. 
the places in our numbers are an exponent of, of 10. So our, our base two numbers, all we're doing is changing these tens to twos. So we have a ones place, a twos place, a fours place, an eights place, or two to the zero, two to the one, two to the squared, two cubed. And so the binary number, which uh, in situations where we need to distinguish, like is this a base 10 number or a binary number or what, uh, the prefix 0b is often used to denote that this kind of root number is, is binary. And so our, our binary number, uh, 1, 1, is 1 times 2 to the 1 plus 1 times to the zero or three. So to take three and say base ten and write it in binary, we do one one. So these numbering systems also uh, tell us uh, how many unique digits are used in that in that system. So our base ten system. We have digits 0 through 9. And then once we want to go past 9, we carry over into the kind of next place, and we go back to 1, 0. So we have 10 different digits in base 10, and we have two different digits in base 2, 0 and 1. And then once we're at 1 and we want to go one higher, we carry over to the next place and we get 1, 0. 1, 1. And if we want to go 1 more than 1, 1, we have 1, 0, 0 to represent 4. Very not tiny piece of chalk. Excellent. All right. So why do we care about, uh, any ideas about why, uh, why we would care about binary? Uh, when we're thinking about computer systems. Yes? I'm guessing the computer doesn't, uh, do not, like it doesn't work with numbers in uh, base 10, it's how it works them. That's exactly right. That when we store numbers on a computer, uh, they are stored in binary. Uh, why, like, is this something that we could, that we could just change, or is there some reason that we kind of have to use binary? Yeah. Uh, it's really difficult to do with, like, you have a bottom off switch, it's not like a, there's no, it's, you can't do an analog or a digital. Yes. The, so you have an on stage or off stage, that's it. Yeah, when we have circuits inside a computer system, they have high voltage or low voltage. They have electric current or don't. Uh, and so that maps very well to a representation of numbers where each digit is one on, zero off. And so this binary of on or off corresponds to the actual like, physical electronics uh, of a computer. And so when we want to represent uh, data, it's going to be in binary. But uh, binary is a bit cumbersome. We only have two digits. If we want to write the number four, it takes three of them. And you imagine larger numbers, it quickly gets very annoying to, to write them down and count how many digits there are, uh, and, and so on. So uh, that brings me to the other numbering system. Base 16 or hexadecimal. And so this operates on exactly the same principles uh, that were outlined for base 10 and base 2, where uh, we have 16 to the 0, 16 to the 1, 16 squared, um, or like a 1's place, a 16's place, a 256's place. And uh, we might ask, okay, well, 
we, we talked about why, why binary, we had this on off, um, but why, why hexadecimal? Yes? That's exactly right, that we, I was just complaining about how cumbersome how many digits we're going to have to deal with in, in binary. And in hexadecimal, every four binary digits gives us one digit of hexadecimal. And that's because when we have four binary digits, each digit can be zero or one. It gives us 16 possible combinations of these four binary digits. 16 possible combinations, you say, well, base 16, each digit of base 16 is one of 16 different values. Just like each digit of base 10 is one of 10 different, uh, different digits. Now, we're faced with a problem of, well, our, our, the, our, our number is 0 through 9, well, that's 10 digits. Where are we getting the other, uh, the other 6 uh, for, for hexadecimal? We have to, you know, rustle up some digits somewhere. Uh, and we're just going to use letters. So we can write some base 10. And then as we write base 16, when we get to 10, we just start using letters. So A for 10, B for 11, C for 12, D for 13, E for 14, F for 15. And then once we get to F, that's 15 to get to 16, That would be hex one zero. And just like we have a, a prefix for binary of zero B, hexadecimal we denote with zero X. As like this is 10 in hexadecimal, which would be 16 in base 10. And to bring the binary into this, we have one, one, one zero, one, one. One zero zero and so this this chart of uh, base 10, base 16, and, and binary is in the, the notes that would be posted for, for today. So that's something you'll, you'll be able to refer to as we get used to, uh, to how, this is all, how this is all working. Uh, what are your questions on uh, binary or, or hexadecimal? Uh, are you talking about the, the OX part or the 10 part? The 10 part. The 10 part. So uh, if we think about um, 10 and base 10, that's like 1, 10, and 0, 1. 10 and base 16 is 1, 16 plus 0, 1. Other questions? Yes. Um, yes. Good catch. So 16 would be a 1 and 4 zeros. Um, uh, I, I said that kind of each hexadecimal digit kind of maps to an exact four-digit uh, four binary uh, uh, pattern. You notice that I didn't write all of these as four digits. 
uh, because I could fill in zeros for any that, that are left off. Uh, and this will be a common thing throughout the course where uh, we'll, we'll often be dealing with quantities that are a fixed number of binary digits or they're called bits. Each binary digit is called a bit. So if I say that we have a four bit number, that means a number that's between, that uses four binary digits that's between zero and 15. If these are all four bit binary numbers. We'll also uh, typically talk about computer memory in terms of bytes, where eight bits, zero through 255, is called a byte. Uh, and in fact, computer memory, the technology is set up such that the smallest kind of unit that it uh, stores is the byte. So uh, computer memory is separated out into individual bytes. Um, we also have Four bits is a nibble. So, well, computer science humor for you. I didn't come up with that. That is actually what they called it. Um, but there you go. Other questions? All right, we have a few minutes. So, what uh, I would like to There we go. I'd like to uh, show you uh, that something we're going to see in this course is that everything is bits. That when we're talking about data on the computer, it's just ones and zeros, and it's up to the application, the program, the hardware, whatever it is that's dealing with that data to interpret what those bits mean. But everything is just ones and zeros. So consider a, a six digit hex number, 4E6F21. Uh, this would be a, a 24 bit uh, quantity. And if this were stored on a computer, we wouldn't necessarily know what it was. But a computer program could interpret it as a base 10 integer, which would give us 5.1 million. Uh, it could interpret it as a string, in which case it would be no exclamation point. And there's, it's the same, the same data in both cases, but we treat it as an integer or treat it as a string. Uh, we could treat it as a color, and it's this nice olive green, 4E6F21. Or we could treat it as a real number, and it's 7.2 times 10 to the negative 39. It's all just bits. And as we go through, we're going to see kind of the, the power inherent in being able to kind of take whatever it is there and interpret it uh, in different ways in different contexts. How is it a real number? How is that the real number representation of that? So if we take the, uh, the, uh, this value stored in memory and interpret it as being in the IEEE 754 standard, what we get is 7.2 times 10 to the negative 30. Um, and for, for both this and the, the integer, it would actually be taking that value and assuming that it's 32 bits and just has zeros for the digits that, that aren't shown. Other questions? All right, so that will, that will do it for today. There are some uh, practice questions in the notes that we posted. Uh, there's also this uh, 
Game flippy bit in the attack of the hexadecimals from base 16. A great way to practice your, your binary to hexadecimal conversions. Uh, on Moodle, there is an introductory survey to help me learn a little bit about you and what you're looking for in the course. Uh, please fill that out by, uh, by Friday. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you in, in my office this afternoon or on Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.